experience in the developing a career and uh, she'll talk for about 10, 15 minutes and then we can ask her questions. Please, thank you. Yeah, uh, so good afternoon. So as I say, I'm not so well prepared as the rest of the speakers because I was asked all of a sudden to be kind of give this talk. First of all, I would like to say that I have attended many of the talks this morning and they look very impressive. So I'm really, I have had the time and say, which suggestion could I give to this group of bright people? They don't need any suggestion for me. So I want to make it so, but if you have questions, ask me. So what I thought I could talk, of course I can talk about, in a way, I, I did a lot of my uh, career in Italy, so I'm very familiar with the Italian system because I was a professor there, head of the department, and for various reasons I moved to the US, actually because they asked me if I wanted to move. But one reason, to be honest, which motivated me to move was because I thought in Italy, young people were not really treated well. There was a lot of unfairness toward the young people. I still remember, at least when um, I was there, the model was for a young person to you know, become an associate professor and then a professor. He or she had to be the slave of a powerful full professor in Italy. So at a certain point, when I, I didn't like that because I thought you know, we, we needed to change a bit. So I, I still remember I, I was at the head of the department and we did not have anyone in bioinformatics. So I told my full professor colleagues, we should hire some, somebody and then you, a very bright PhD student who was really working with biologists at the University of Milan, he really understood their language. So that is very important for multidisciplinary risk. So I told them, why don't we give him an assistant professor position? The, the, the reply was, oh, but there is no full professor in this area, in this department. And I told them, but he is much better than many of you. <laughs> so he really doesn't need any full professor. He can really do. Then actually I succeeded in hiring him. And then my regret when I moved, I said, now this poor guy will be left, you know, without <laughs> some, even though I'm not a bioinformatician, anyone helping him. But then eventually learned, they got an associate professor at the Department of Biology. They really appreciated him a lot. They understood that even though he was a computer scientist, he understood the biology. Which this leads to something I want to briefly talk that it was something I can perhaps just briefly discuss, which is uh, this idea of multidisciplinary research. Now, Purdue University is pushing that a lot in many different ways. We have a discovery park where we have all those centers which really non range from nanotechnology, biomedical engineering, and so forth. And actually, uh, when I joined uh, you know, this Discovery Park uh, being the director of one center, I, I noticed that a lot of the centers were not really collaborating among themselves. Now we are collaborating much more, but Purdue is giving, uh, in some cases, even giving a lot of positions uh, which are across the department and so forth. But one problem the young faculty always have, they say, is it right for me to engage in multidisciplinary research? Because of course, a lot of departments still are very traditional and they value your discipline and your contribution. So if you are a computer scientist, you must have all the papers in the top conferences. Even if you've done an excellent paper published in Cell or, or some top, computer scientists <coughs> wouldn't appreciate that. So that, uh, that is, is a major issue, I understand. So sometimes I feel uh, Perhaps, uh, you know, one has uh, to move into doing really multidisciplinary work after being tenured, for example, a little bit later. But at the end, I don't think there is a, a unique way, in a way. Uh, I know multidisciplinary research can be very rewarding. And, and it really depends on the specific individual. So what I notice that, for example, in some cases, I had uh, some assistant professor in CS who were not able to get funding and the reason was because NSF was not funding their specific area of CS. And therefore, however, they got engaged in working with people in, uh, in, uh, you know, the, the, in, in geology, uh, envi environment, and then got a lot of funding with them. Okay. So for computer scientists, this is a particular important thing because we are kind of called you know, in many other areas to help all the other people so coming up with algorithms specifics for them. 
But even mathematicians more and more have to move into other domains, try to apply their mathematical skills. So the question is, uh, what should you do? I think that, again, may depend on circumstances, but from the int intellectually, this can be very rewarding. You can really get uh, so many different ideas talking to other people that you know, it's really worth the effort. But again, the question is, how do you, should you proceed? What can you do? What I found in my career early, actually I was in Milan, that leveraging students can be something that can help you a lot. So when I was in Milan, and ahead of the time, I was trying to do collaboration with the humanities schools, with the medical school as well, uh, which again is very interesting because uh, to be honest, uh, different schools, at least especially in Italy, have uh, different traditions. They really, you know, we, uh, for example, we try to work with archeologists. Uh, they're very hierarchical. So professors treat uh, the assi uh, you know, assistant professor as like students. But in any case, so my goal is I needed to work with the archeologists. Uh, sometimes they don't speak our language. But I found a student who was very good in, in selling them everything we would do in computer science. <laughs> they would become convinced that, that was useful. So I was impressed that to see this young PhD student who had a disability. So after a while, uh, I really couldn't talk to them because they really say, you know, I don't understand. Uh, they keep repeating the same things. Don't let, don't try to understand us. So this is something that you may try to explore if you have some, you know, in your group of students, someone uh, who may be kind of has uh, the attitude to, do, to go a little bit, uh, you know, in a different area. That's something that perhaps you should leverage if, if you feel. And again, um, there are many opportunities. What is also very important, again, uh, and I, I do this a lot, uh, but in my position, uh, because I am supposed to really uh, work with people from different areas. I really try to understand a lot what, what the other area is, uh, what are their techniques. But it comes to a personal level. Again, again, in research, in multidisciplinary collaborations, in international collaborations, a lot really depends on the actual individuals you deal with. <laughs> okay? So I really make an effort to try to understand how can this person work better with me. I never try to change the other people. I never try to impose uh, my ideas. Uh, the, the reason, uh, and actually, probably if you look at my publication record, I have hundreds of collaborators. Because uh, my attitude is always say, you know, what I know is a little, what the other person, even younger, uh, much younger than me, he knows or she knows much more than I do. So I always try to learn. And I try to learn, and this is really helps me a lot. I try to understand the person. So I notice I have colleagues that no matter which project you propose to them, you say, oh, this is a project, for example, to deal with uh, analyzing this infusion pump data from those you know, 30 hospitals. They will always propose you what, what they do, even if this has nothing to do with the problem. Okay. Then uh, I'm developing, so I know now, okay, that person is in this way. So in this project, uh, this wouldn't be the right person to work with. Uh, I'm uh, kind of, <laughs> you know, extending my knowledge, my network, you know, I told the people I know to whom I can work with for what. This is very important to understand what you, people you have around because that really helps you a lot. And, uh, and so this is what, uh, more or less, I, wanna, I wanted to say about multidisciplinary research. Uh, but again, uh, I must say that we talk to companies. For example, recently we were talking to the Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Company because we are getting a lot of projects with them. Some of them are really fascinating, which will deal with the, um, chemistry, synthesis, and purification. Uh, which I will have to try to understand, uh, you know, and remember what I studied in chemistry in high school. <laughs> uh, but, but that is really fascinating. But, um, but they say correctly, we have ahead of us very big challenges. Industry by sector, especially in certain areas like uh, drug discovery. Industry which has uh, so much need of investment, you know, this research requires billions of dollars. They say, we really needed to partner with universities. We really needed to collaborate. And universities have to take a multidisciplinary approach. Recently, the National Academy of Engineering had a workshop focusing on multidisciplinary research. 
MIT has published a very nice report talking about the new approaches to life sciences have to involve uh, uh, researchers from physics, mathematics, engineers, medical sciences, computer science. They all have to work together if we really have to find solution. In this workshop, I've seen many presentations, especially the ones dealing with the environment, <coughs> climate change. They all require this big efforts. So you have a nice uh, landscape in front of you. I mean, I refer to the young people. <laughs> and uh, so I think I'll stop here, but if you have questions, ask me. If you have any questions. <laughs> I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, being a part of a multidisciplinary team yeah. is something that uh, in clinical world we, we, uh, we face it every day, especially here yeah. in the United States. Uh, there is the chance that um, mm, moving from postdoc to mm. uh, junior faculty, uh, a, um, a researcher has to focus more on some topics mm -hmm. and uh, mm, being too, too flexible yeah. may uh, hurt in yeah. the further step. Uh, that's exactly a major question. Now, I can tell you what happened with my experience. I had just finished the school, so, and I did my thesis on a certain topic. Then I went to work for CNR, and then I had to work uh, on a project which was very different. And I got very upset with, I said, no, I want to keep working on my research. And they said, no, you have to work on something else. Then uh, I started working on this something else. And then uh, another topic came, which I really wanted to work a lot. But then there was a colleague of mine who was very senior. He had, to, he had the president. So that told me, you work on computer human interfaces which to be honest is a topic which I hate, mainly because, no, because uh, even though I was very young, I, I read the papers, I realized that, that doing uh, this human-computer interaction experiments is very difficult business to do. It's not just a matter of, say, I put an icon on the top of the screen. It's really understand the cognitive abilities of people, how they react when interfacing with a computer. And I said, there is no way I can do significant research here in Italy. Uh, I was looking at IBM. IBM would put uh, 50 people in using languages, looking at the reaction, uh, many parameters. I, I don't know why to do this. So I said, why should I do a research in which I really won't be able to do anything good, but I had to do? So, but then this gave me a lot of ability to really be very flexible in the future, okay? So, but for a young, uh, my experience has been that usually it's good to keep be focused on his or her research, because at the end, the tenure is an important thing here, but try to keep an eye open. And uh, I found that uh, in many cases, but this is true for my area, I don't know if it is, for, so people come and ask us, can you do this work, this algorithm for us? Sometimes I say, yeah, I can, we can do, but there is nothing new for us as a computer scientist. Okay, it's new for the other discipline, but for us. But still I found that if you think hard, you can still come up with ideas where you can innovate in your areas, okay? But then the idea to say, you know, keep focus, but keep an eye on this opportunity because, uh, and then as you progress, you can take a more leadership roles. And that's where you have a chance to do really major discovery. I have seen a lot of, you know, people, uh, for example, we have a Purdue, a food prize, uh, somebody who got uh, the food prize, uh, which is uh, the Nobel pr Prize for, for food sustainability. It's Professor Gebisa Eieta, which I work with him a lot. And again, his research was uh, really uh, done on producing a variety of sorghum for uh, using in Africa, uh, and this sorghum was resistant to this certain type of disease. And again, uh, when he was uh, very young, he was able to work with people from, di from chemistry from different areas. And that's how he came uh, with this important discovery. But that is a critical, you know, <laughs> a critical point. Okay, thank you, Sam.